Hello and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. If you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, just pop along to patreon.com forward slash the history network. The history network.org podcast season 31 episode 3 interwar naval treaties and battleship development this episode was written by mike harran at the end of the first world war france and italy had wanted the german high seas fleet divided between them britain and the usa wanted it scuffled which germany did anyway without permission the resulting Treaty of Versailles imposed strict limits on size and number of warships the newly constituted German government was allowed to build and maintain. This nullified the threat of Germany at sea. Former allies, Britain, France and Italy, now became suspicious of one another's intentions in a post-war world. These tensions were not helped by the US President Wilson expressing his intention to increase the size of the United States Navy to 50 modern battleships. At the same time, Japan initiated an 8x8 program, where it would build 8 battleships and 8 battle cruisers, all much larger and more powerful than those they were replacing. In a war-weary world where governments were not keen on massive armament spending programmes, the years between the end of the First World War and the outbreak of the Second World War, would see various treaties enacted. The purpose of these agreements would be to prevent an expensive naval arms race, as was seen at the turn of the century as countries scrambled to build the new Dreadnought-class ships. The first of these naval agreements would be the 1922 Washington Treaty. The public mood in the US at this period disapproved of any future intervention in foreign wars. In Britain, with the First World War fresh in the population's mind, the eye-watering cost of the Navy's planned four new warships, four new battle cruisers, with more battleships planned in subsequent years, was not welcomed. The result was the Washington Naval Conference called in 1921 between the United States, Britain, France, Italy and Japan. The subsequent treaty called a halt to the building of battleships by the signatories and to maintain a balance of power at an agreed ratio to the total tonnage of their warships. Since the USA and Britain maintained fleets in the Pacific and the Atlantic, they were allotted the highest tonnage allowances, with 500,000 tonnes. After that came Japan with 300,000 tonnes, and France and Italy with 175,000 tonnes each. Initially, the British public were not keen on the agreement, as they feared they would not have enough ships to defend the empire and trade routes. The huge amounts spent on the navy had always been unpopular with certain elements in Britain, and the Dominions, so when it became clear that American foreign policy was unlikely to bring the two countries into conflict and they were often aligned, the treaty was accepted with the wider public. For the Japanese, the naval agreement felt like a snub by the Western powers. Factions within the Imperial Japanese Navy felt this was America and Britain ensuring their dominance in the Japanese sphere of influence, though it's worth pointing out that in the Pacific a concentrated Japanese fleet would be greater than either the warships available to Britain or America. The French too were dissatisfied with the ratio. They felt that their tonnage allowance was too low and should be greater than that of the Japanese. In the end, an agreement on the numbers of cruisers and submarines smoothed out concerns regarding capital ships. Further disagreements from France, Italy and Japan were quelled through pressure from Britain and America, who finally convinced them to accept the limit. The result of the Washington Naval Treaty was to limit new battleship construction. New projects were scrapped altogether, such as all four of the Japanese fast battleships. Other large ships were converted into aircraft carriers, both the USS Lexington and Saratoga, were originally designed as battle cruisers before being built as carriers as a direct result of the treaty. 
the 1930 London Naval Treaty sought to build up on the Washington Agreement limiting naval ship building, addressing issues not covered in the original treaty. It was agreed submarines should be limited to 2,000 tonnes. To put that tonnage into some context, the German Type 7 U-boat, which was the most common U-boat of the war, weighed around 700 to 800 tonnes. Even the German resupply submarines were under this 2,000 tonne limitation. The size limit for submarines was so large in the treaty that it was essentially meaningless. The treaty sought to clarify the light and heavy cruisers, and again each signatory was assigned its own limit. These agreements on the displacement tonnage of ships and armament size limitations had unseen consequences. Where the maximum calibre of a ship's guns had been reached, ways were found to circumvent restrictions by placing extra gun barrels on the main gun turrets, keeping to the original calibre, but at the same time doubling or even tripling the firepower. There were other developments which stretched the spirit of the agreements. The American Nevada-class battleships had the elevation of their main guns increased from 15 degrees to 30 degrees, this effectively increased the range of the main 14-inch guns by over 10,000 metres to 31,400 metres or around 34,300 yards. The British insisted this violated the terms of the treaty, and while the British scrapped or stopped construction of 16 major battleships, the 40,000-tonne displacement HMS Hood escaped the treaty restrictions only after signing a compromise deal with the Japanese. The treaties threw up problems of a non-technical nature, problems best described as national pride. Britain and the US, being the most powerful, were non-participants in this contest with the largest fleets. They stood aloof of France, Italy and Japan, as they vied for third position. France insisted it be ahead of Japan. Italy insisted it be equal to France. Yet Japan was on the verge of overtaking France, being the first non-Western power to equal or exceed a Western power. Ultimately, the rivalry would be moot, as when war broke out, the rapid fall of France in 1940 would cause the French fleet to flee to Algeria, where it would be sunk by the British, at Mers el Kabir, to prevent it being surrendered to the Germans. The future would prove similarly ignominious for the Italians. Mussolini, encouraged by Hitler to believe himself as the reincarnation of the Caesars, was urged to build a big fleet. Although the fleet was built, and at times sallied forth, it was largely kept bottled up by the Royal Navy in Taranto Harbour. The Germans were not signatories to either the Washington or London agreements. German naval ambitions were restricted by the post-First World War Treaty of Versailles, which limited the navy to ships of 10,000 tonnes displacement, though it did not specify the size of the armament they could be equipped with. The result of this restriction was the development of what were euphemistically termed pocket battleships, coming within the 10,000 tonnes displacement limit and armed with six 11-inch guns mounted in triple turrets. The 1930 London Treaty was to run until 1936, when it was agreed the signatories would reconvene to reaffirm the agreement. The remit of this conference was to limit the growth in naval armaments until its expiration in 1942. Talks opened in December 1935. Within weeks, Japan withdrew from the conference. The absence of a major naval power such as Japan was a serious blow, preventing any agreement on the number of warships. The resulting treaty was mainly concerned with auxiliary ships, although methods of negating the rules regarding gun calibre by mounting extra barrels in each turret were addressed. Prior to 1921, only the US and Italy had triple gun mountings. By 1936, this had become a standard practice. France, Britain and the US all used quadruple guns mounted in one turret, which allowed for extra firepower. The drawback of four guns firing from one turret was that it resulted in less space in the turret, which resulted in a slower rate of fire 
as each turret had to share a loader with some of the smaller guns. Range also had to be considered, as no matter how many barrels a ship carried, its guns were of no threat if it could not achieve a useful range, the average now 25,000 yards as opposed to that of 12,000 at the Battle of Jutland. Also considered was radar, a deciding factor in the Royal Navy's sinking of the German surface raider Scharnhorst. Multiple purpose guns came into being to circumvent calibre limits to be used against aircraft, surface craft and submarines, giving an increased combat value per ship. The treaty began to unravel, though, almost as soon as it was agreed. The displacement tonnage of 35,000 tonnes was agreed for capital ships, but there was an allowance in the agreement for this to rise if a non-signatory nation built a ship larger than this. In 1938, this escalation clause caused those parties to the treaty to agree to a new upper displacement limit of 45,000 tonnes. With the rise of Hitler, Germany had steadily broken the Treaty of Versailles without any international repercussions, with Japan failing to take part in the negotiation of the 1936 London Agreement and Italy subsequently refusing to sign it, the battleship-building holiday, which had begun with the signing of the Washington Naval Agreement in 1922, was effectively over. Geopolitical rivalries were overtaking the treaties. The US and Britain, having stayed within the limits set by both the Washington and the London treaties, were now outgunned by Japan, Britain having 14-inch guns, the US having 16-inch guns, and the Japanese having 18-inch guns. Ignoring the international treaties set off a chain of reaction of modernisation and shipbuilding which the treaties had tried to suppress. In the interwar agreements there was the implication that the Japanese navy was not on a par with their western counterparts, hence Britain and America allowed Japan such comparably large ratio of ships. This oversight was something that would come back to haunt the Allies in 1941-42. But as Admiral Yamamoto had warned, the Imperial Japanese Navy would need a ratio of over 7 to 1 to win in the Pacific. Having spent a decade in the USA, he was more than aware of American industrial capacity, which could be harnessed in case of war. This production capacity did indeed easily outstrip that of Japan, and completely blew out of the water all treaty obligations and requirements to a scale hitherto unseen during the Second World War. Thanks, Mike, for that script. If you would like to write a script for us, then drop us an email with your idea to info at thehistorynetwork.org. And once again, if you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, pop along to patreon.com forward slash the History Network, and thanks very much to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network.org podcast, written by Mike Harran, read by Nick Barker. Mm-hmm.